also, um, I did want to thank Maya McKenzie and Eric Brown for their support. I also want to thank our four panelists, uh, Alan Brown, uh, Walt Mayo, Dr. McKenzie, Teresa McKenzie, and Dr. Salome Normale for willing to share your experiences with, with us throughout uh, this, uh, this hour. Um, it's not an easy conversation to have, but I think it is a conversation that we, we need to have at this time. Also, uh, I would like to, at this time, ask uh, Dr. Christy Barnes, a chairperson for our Ohio University Southern Council on Diversity and Inclusion, to have remarks. Uh, Dr. Barnes. Hi, I want to thank everyone for being here. I wanted to kind of talk a little about why I think these conversations are so important. They give us an opportunity to engage in perspective taking. And although we may not necessarily consider ourselves to have biases, it's in having conversations with others, have the opportunity to understand how their experiences may be different from our own. We have this tendency to live in our own individual realities, think that that is the collective experience. But when we have conversations like these, it gives us the opportunity to become more self-aware. And by being more self-aware, we have an opportunity to make a change, change that starts with ourselves. So I really want to thank everyone who participated in today, whether as a panelist or as a guest. I want to thank uh, campus for giving us the opportunity to have these kinds of important conversations. So, And I want to thank uh, Robert Pleasant and the Diversity Council for everything that they did to uh, create these opportunities for us. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barnes. And I want to echo that. The conversations are important. Uh, before we begin, as if you noticed in the description, we we intentionally uh, asked that this this particular dialogue, the first one, be one that is just of Ohio University Southern faculty, staff, and students and alumni. And the reason for that is we wanted we're a family here. We believe that we are a family, and we want to. Uh, get an idea of how our family is feeling during this time. With all the divisions that are going on in our country, um, how are we all feeling? So I wanna start the questions off there. And and Mr. Mayo, I'll start with you, and then we'll just go around uh, to Teresa, Dr. Normale, and then Dr. McKenzie, and then Dr. Normale, and then Mr. Brown. But with the division, so much division going on, um, how are you doing? And then in addition to that, Give me your initial thoughts on this moment that we're living in. Who should start, uh, Robert? Well, if you would, please. OK, uh, well, it's, it's a challenging time. And I was very upset uh, viewing some of the videos uh, in the news. And I, I think I was probably more upset seeing the videos that they played on the news lately than I've ever been upset. And so it's affected me in a way that um, I'm sure I'm going to become more active. I think I'm going to become more actively involved. Uh, over the past 25 years, I've done a lot of tutoring with uh, uh, young black uh, kids here in Ironton. Uh, the parents often call me and ask me if I'll help one of their, uh, you know, their children that is having trouble in school. Uh, but I think I'm going to become even more actively involved in uh, political affairs here in the uh, in large county. Dr. McKenzie. Um, hi, everyone. Um, today I'm OK. Yesterday I wasn't so much. Um, it goes back and forth and I'm going to get teary, but um, this is a hard time. Um, I'm faced with a lot of realities I didn't know were there um, or I assume we had gotten past. I thought we were a different country. I thought we were more united. I thought we cared more for everyone. And this whole summer with the pandemic and on one side and the violence, racial violence and the intolerance and um, everything that's happened, social media is horrible. Um, I pretty much, I nixed most of it. Uh, it's a horrible place to be right now. Um, people that I thought were my friends and they still think they're my friends share memes that are um, racist. Um, 
share memes that are intolerant, share memes that are hurtful. And so today I'm okay, um, but it's not always. Um, I'm afraid to drive at night. As you can see, I have braids now. Uh, one of the things that I've done this summer is I've embraced um, more of who I am um, from what I let go of when I decided to be a professional. I couldn't have braids. I couldn't wear natural hair. So um, I've decided that to be a professional, I can have braids. I can wear natural hair and I've embraced that more, but I'm still, I still real. Uh, when I find out people that I thought were my friends have these thoughts and they don't see it as racist. That's the thing. They think it's okay to share these memes. They think they have a right to share these memes and these hurtful ideas. They think they're on the right side of history and it hurts if I say something to them and then they vote off and say, well, it's my right. It's my freedom of speech. Okay. Well, I kind of want to live past tomorrow. I kind of want to not be afraid to drive after dark. I kind of want to not be afraid to have my son drive. Uh, we recently started driving, practicing driving again. He doesn't have his license. Part of that was me. I didn't want um, him behind the wheel of a car as a black guy, black boy with dreads. Um, Part of it was him I found out recently. He was also afraid. He had the same fear. I didn't know this until we talked. So um, today I'm okay. I'm teary right now because I'm thinking about it, but I'm not okay every day. Back to normal life. You're muted. You're All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, like um, Dr. McKinsey said, today, this morning or afternoon, I'm okay. Um, during the summer, I wasn't. And I don't think when I saw George Floyd on the streets of Minnesota being murdered, that I have quite seen anything like that before in my life. I just, I mean, I, I didn't know what was going on. I was just sitting and then I saw it and I was, all I was doing was like, wait, 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 look, 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 look. And then it's like, no. Um, and I think what the summer did was resurrect for me a lot of things I wanted to forget. Because I think when you, when you go through several experiences, uh, part of survival is that you bury those things so that you can then move on. And what has happened this summer with, you know, George Floyd uh, and the rest of them is basically remembering things I did not want to remember because they were too painful to remember. And then the fear that comes with it. I don't think I've been as much afraid now. Uh, I'm scared. I never used to be scared to go to the grocery store. Um, I never used to be scared to, you know, take a walk on the street. But now I'm walk walking and I'm looking to see who's behind me, who is on my side, what they're saying. I never used to be afraid of police officers. I'm scared. I'm not just scared about me, I'm scared about my children. I have a, I have a boy, you know, who um, I, I look at him and I go, wow. I mean, how, how does the society we, we live in look at him? And I think part of um, this whole conversation, part of what we forget is that these are human beings. I just finished, I read it, I just finished reading a book, uh, Between the World and Me, um, and it's part of, a text I'm teaching for uh, the Black Lead course um, this fall. And um, Coates makes the argument, that, and, and I think that kind of resonated with me, is that George Floyd and the rest of them were just people's children, right? And parents have invested themselves into these children. They've paid for them to get an education. 
they've 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 nurtured them so that they can become members of society and when that life is taken away the loss i mean as a person i'm watching it right and it's a little bit distance from me and i do have that empathy because i can see myself there but can you imagine the excruciating pain that a parent goes through with such a loss and and i think I'm, I'm, and when i look at that and then i look at my son and i look at my children and i and i just i just shake my head because it is it's too painful for me to wrap my head around it thank you mr brown yes uh kind of as, as you guys have kind of said already uh i'm on a little bit of the opposite end of it because I don't have kids, but I remember my parents and my grandparents talking about some of the stuff they grew up with. And to see that kind of making a loop back around, it's it's almost like, you know, for a little bit, you as a kid, you're like, no way things were like that. No way. Like, what do you mean you guys had a separate water fountain? Like, what? Like, but to hear it now, I mean, it's, I think the word I would use to feel, to explain how I feel is almost fatigue. And some of it comes from, like you said, social media and different things that we're constantly bombarded with. But so there's certain times where I want to delete everything and disappear off the map because you, it gets very exhausting um, in that aspect of it. So fatigue is probably a huge word that I would say that I'm feeling. I mean, even working on, and I used to work at Channel 3. Um, so you'd hear constant, you know, for that eight or nine hours of your day, it's constantly filled with like what's going on and what's going on in the world. So. I'm a little shocked. I'm a little just fatigued of just hearing about it all. I never thought that I would be kind of living what my parents were talking about or seeing the same thing that my parents grew up with, because for a while it seemed like it kind of at least gotten a little better. And now I feel like it's kind of reemerged almost. So I'm I'm kind of just worn out from it all. <laughs> yeah. And it does. It takes its toll after a while. And I think we're all experiencing that. That's why this conversation is so important. I do want to remind everyone that the chat is available. Dr. Barnes will be monitoring the chat. So if you have questions that you would like to uh, to include in this conversation, please feel free to put those in the chat. Let me follow up with this question. Um, how would you describe and we'll start with Dr. McKenzie on this one. How would you describe uh, your experience either growing up in this area or living in this area as an African-American person or as a black person in general? Wow, that's a good question. So I'm not originally from here. So uh, my perspective is different. I grew up in uh, rural North Carolina in a small town um, called Ramsar. Um, in Ramsar, there was a clear definition, a clear line between the black community and the white community. You knew when you left our neighborhood. Um, and so when I got out of the Air Force and I moved here, uh, um, my husband and I, who is not black, were driving around and trying to find out where we were going to live. And I was like, oh, well, where's the black neighborhood? And he said, what do you mean the black neighborhood? I said, you know where the black people live. And he said, I don't know that there is one. So I started talking to people and I found that there isn't a black neighborhood in Ashland. <laughs> there's a neighborhood where you can afford to live and a neighborhood where you can't afford to live. So it's not, there's no dividing in terms of race. Um, so for me, moving here was wonderful. And I thought this is a great place to raise kids because it was not what I was used to. I'm used to, um, like Alan was talking about listening to his parents. I grew up not with black and white water fountains, but I grew up where we had black neighborhoods. Um, I knew when I went in the grocery store how I was going to be treated. I knew I was going to be followed. I knew I was going to be questioned. I knew my bag was going to be searched before I left just to make sure I didn't steal anything. And I knew if I had to return something, I had to keep the receipt or it would not be returned. I would be accused of stealing. So here it was different. I was loving life here um, because that wasn't what I grew up with. And it was such a different experience. And this was so much better. And it still is. Don't get me wrong. This is so much better than what I grew up with. And my kids have grown up with this. But as my kids get older, I find out that they also experience some things in the schools um, that I didn't know about. Um, so it has its causes, it has its negatives. For me, up until recently, it was all, the negatives were minimal. Now it's, again, social media. Um, and I have to take a break 
from it. And only if I go, I only go to see whose birthday it is so I can tell my friends happy birthday and then get out. Um, it, it's, it's different now. Um, it's not the same. I see across the street from me, there are five houses with uh, Trump tent signs in the yard. Right across the street from me. Um, my daughter begged me before she moved, mom, don't put any signs in your yard. Please don't put a target on your back. Before this summer, she probably never would have said that because I've had signs in my yard. I had Hillary signs. I had Obama mm -hmm. signs. This summer, she begged me, please don't put any signs in your yard. So before this, before 2016, 2015, I thought this was a like, great place to raise my kids. Now I'm thinking one day I'm going to probably move because the hate in my face is hard. It's hard. Thank you. Dr. Normalay, same question. Well, I'm, I'm probably the newest uh, transplant here. <laughs> um, well, I wasn't born in the U.S. I was born in Nigeria, and um, I came here. Actually, I was thinking about it this morning, 34 years ago today. So happy birthday to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but growing up, I did not know I was a black person. That was not the way I described myself. I knew I was a female. I knew I was an Igbo person. I didn't even consider myself Nigerian or African or black. I had to discover I was black when I came to this country. <laughs> and I remember telling my student, one of my students at UK one time, and I said, I didn't know what racism was either before I came to this country. And when, you know, my early days and years in the U.S., when racism was happening around me, I didn't know they were racism. I just thought they were odd. Like I go to a store and somebody, you know, I would always see people around me and I go, they'll say, ma'am, can we help you? And I go, no, I'm just browsing. And then two seconds later, the same person will come around, ma'am. And I said, no, I'm browsing. <laughs> it wasn't until later that I realized that I said, well, you have nothing for me to steal. There's nothing here that I want. <laughs> which was always my, my right. But I, I, had no, I had no contest for evaluating um, some of those um, experiences. Um, but, you know, I should, I should begin, which is really the tragedy of racism, is the fact that when you've lived in this country long enough, you begin to know what it is. <laughs> you begin to understand in many ways that it manifests itself. And for me, because I didn't grow up in this country, I had a buffer, right? I knew who I was before I came here. And there's nothing would change that. But can you imagine being born in this country and growing up there, like my children, and I'm picking up my, you know, my, my, my four-year-old from kindergarten, and she just, she comes out crying, and I say, what's wrong? She goes, I just want to, I don't want to be black anymore. I want to be white. And I go, why do you want to be, why do you want to be white? He goes, well, because they treat them better. And then I had to go through that whole thing about what happened today. What was your experience like today? Why don't you want to be black anymore? And I don't understand the psychological ramifications of it. And uh, my oldest doesn't live in this country anymore. She, she, <laughs> she left. Six years ago, she told me she was going to school in Ireland, and I helped her get there, but I had no idea she wasn't coming back. And when I spoke to her, and she says, well, I don't want to be a foreigner in my country. I'd rather be a foreigner in another person's country. When I'm in Ireland and they treat me like a foreigner, then I know I'm a foreigner. But I'm gonna, <laughs> when I'm in the U.S. and they treat me like I don't belong, it hurts. And she said, she said, you will never understand that because your experience is still, well, you weren't born here. And, and I think for me, that says a lot. That, that really, that says a lot about the black experience and being a country where it is your home, but you're treated as if it's not your home. And there are people that do not see it as your home, as if you belong. And you have nowhere else to go because it is home. Um, that's a very painful experience. 
Thank you. Mr. Brown. Yeah, this is this is pretty heavy from all ends of it. And it's it's interesting to hear everyone else's experience. Um, just I've always grown up in this area and I was born in this area. And, um, you know, it's interesting that sometimes you do almost feel like a foreigner <laughs> uh, at times because people have expectations of you, good or bad, as a black person. Um, I remember things like, oh, he's going to be really good at basketball. I had them fold. Uh, cause I wasn't, <laughs> but jokes on them, I guess. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I could joke around with silly stuff like that, but, it, um, I can't remember who was saying it, but it's almost as if it, the problem happens whenever you take the human element out of it, when you start seeing, well, that's just a black person. They're supposed to do this, or they act like this. And that's kind of something like, I remember even at times, this is weird to even admit or even think about, but at times, like, I would find myself thinking like people, like, as a kid, like, the same thing, like, oh, yeah, I have, I'm a black person, so I have to dress like this, or I should be doing this, or whatever, and it's weird how, like, you kind of get these ingrained thoughts when you're surrounded by that before you figure it out yourself, and, um, like, yeah, I had a big afro back when I was in high school and everything, and, you know, people, even, even for the, I remember there was an article about that not an article but one of the teachers who i mean he never really said hey i'm a racist but not really many people do but there were certain things that bothered him that he would talk about in class and certain like things that were specific to certain communities uh and everything so like i i started wearing my hair differently and and, and things like that it's weird i guess what i'm trying to say is it's odd the things that you learn and you and you kind of do just to stay under the radar a little bit and I guess that's kind of been, I, I'm trying to remember what the exact question was, but uh, I'm kind of just talking about what it's like now for me and what I remember more than anything, I guess. And it sounds like we all kind of have similar experiences in some aspect or another, and we may not even have picked them up, like you said, at first, but now it's, it seems like it's just happening so much more plain as day. It's not even funny anymore. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Mr. Mayo, same question. You know, I'm, I'm older, so I and I was born and raised in Ironton. So when I was a when I was a child, I, I wasn't afraid of living in Ironton, but I knew I knew where I could go. I knew I couldn't go to Cold Grove. My parents would tell me, don't go to Cold Grove. I knew I couldn't go out on 141 riding my bicycle. I knew that, but I wasn't afraid of Ironton. Most of the people I, 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 I came in contact with were people I knew. I went to school with the kids. But in 1955, my feelings changed. My parents were talking about Emmett Till. And I, was, I was nine years old. And the violence of it, the violence of the killing of Emmett Till, 14 years old. My parents were so upset. They were crying and they were talking about Emmett Till. And I was listening, and from that day on, then I was afraid of racism. And I was more attuned. I was more attuned at that point that I was treated differently in school. There were things I could say, things I couldn't say. So Emmett Till was a turning point for me in terms of racism. It made me uh, more aware. And racism is not like here. Racism is not, racism is a tiered thing. It's, it's tiered. For instance, you'll have the person, if you move next door to them, they won't be mean, but they don't want you there. But they'll tolerate you. They'll tolerate you. They'll speak to you. They're pleasant. They're, they're friendly. They're friendly, but not accepting. They're friendly, but not accepting. Then you go up the next level where they will tell you they don't want you there. Why are you here? You know, you ought to live in your own neighborhood. You've got those people. And then you've got the more extreme ones like the neo-Nazis who, who will kill you. They don't want you here on the earth. They don't want you living. They want you gone. And I've experienced all of those. Every, all of those tears, 
The first time I drove on a bus going to Virginia when I was in the Navy, I was a sailor. They stopped in Virginia at a restaurant to for us to eat. I got off the bus, went to the restaurant, and they had a big sign on the door, collared entrance here. I was so afraid I got back on the bus. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go in and eat. I just drove to Norfolk, Virginia, uh, hungry. So I've experienced racism personally on different levels. And one of the ones that's most damaging, honestly, is the one where it's just racial bias, not violence. It's the bias that they have, that subtle bias that erodes and eats at your personality on your, and, your, and your aspirations. That's the one that is the most damaging. I apologize for my, my <laughs> No, that's uh, that's powerful. And I, 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 I lost a son. My son died a couple of years ago. I can't imagine if he had died at the hands of a policeman in a violent manner like George Floyd. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. You said something that touched a nerve in me to erodes and eats at your personality. And I think that's what sometimes uh, we don't understand uh, as we're walking this journey, uh, the power of, of, of what racism and bigotry can do. So thank you for sharing that. Um, with that in mind, and we'll start with Dr. Norma Lay on this question, what, what would you want other people to know about the Black experience? You know, before uh, before the George Floyd um, thing experience, if you ask me that question, I will answer differently and say, well, I want you to know that the Black experience is very diverse. Just like we are human beings, just like, you know, the white experience is diverse too. They are not all the same. And we are not all the same either. And I think that's what we miss when we begin to categorize people, put them in diff different little boxes, is we, huh, we lose that opportunity to actually know people and know, know, know the joy of, 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 of humanity. We miss that a lot. And I still have that, but I think for me, after the judge and, you know, for Mr. Mary, it was Emmett Till. For me, it was George Floyd, because I think that was the first time I actually saw it with my eye. And, and it was like, it, it, it just played over and over and over. And the only thing that really made that, made me not go insane seeing that was the fact that I knew his mother was dead. When he kept saying, Mama, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that touched me, and I and I and I said, "Is his mother alive? Because if his mother is alive, I mean, I just can imagine. I can imagine what she must be going through. And and this, when they told me she passed away, was it two or three years ago? I calmed down a little bit and said, "Okay, she doesn't have to know. She doesn't have to know the pain of being black in this country." And I didn't know that pain until recently either. Because like I said, I don't wake up in the morning thinking I'm black. I didn't grow up thinking I'm black. You know, I just acquired it. You know, the way that racism begins to erode on your sense of confidence. I had, um, I was a black poet long, long time ago when I was at University of Kentucky. He gave a, he gave a presentation, and they asked him something about the U.S. He wasn't born here. He said, "Well, it's unconscionable what America does is, does to its children." I didn't understand that. He said, "It is unconscionable what America does to its children." It just I was what I was 21, 22 at the time. It kind of flew over my head, but I was beginning. I'm beginning to understand that. 
the erosion of self-confidence that racism in this country in all its shape and form and the amount of burden it puts on children growing up right and then as we watch them grow up with that burden and it never lessens it just keeps increasing and increasing and increasing the older than they, that they get and then we blame them <laughs> we blame them for things they can do we blame them for things society tells them they can do you know and for that one person that for some reason excels well whatever well, he did it why can't you do it and I, I think for me, it's, 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 it's in me trying to reconcile where I was <laughs> before the summer and where I am now. There's still, there's still black experience, right? But I, it's, it's a journey I'm trying to reconcile because I am, and I'll tell you the story of what happened, I think was a couple of weeks ago. You know, I woke up in the morning and all I wanted to do was just do what I need. And okay, I had a list of, I gotta do this, 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 this. I get up, I... Feeling happy. It was a Saturday. I drive to Walmart. I pick up what I need, a couple of items, and I, I, I check myself out. And then suddenly I turned. This person at Walmart decided to come and check where I had checked out. And I was wondering, what is it looking for? I mean, I paid. I mean, what did I buy was what oranges and bananas why did he have to come check and I was still very puzzled looking at it somebody else somebody else comes to me mask kind of gives me a hug and said by the way we support you and I'm going uh I'm wearing an OU t-shirt does it mean that um I'm wearing OU t-shirt in in Ashland it took me 20 minutes to figure it out <laughs> that's how dense I am it took me 20 minutes to figure that the, the clerk at Walmart was thinking I was making sure I didn't shoplift for a $10 item. And somebody is seeing that to come give me a hug and tell, him, tell me they support me. It blew my head. I mean, it was like, I'm not going back to Walmart. I don't need that. It was such a happy day. But for the rest of the day, it just ruined my day. I was so, it, it just befuddled my mind. So like I'm I'm struggling to to reconcile where I was before and where I am now. It's it's very confusing. I understand that, Mr. Brown, Alan. Same question. Now, what do you want people to know about this black experience? I was trying to figure out how to answer that because nowadays I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know how to even. There are so many things that people don't see. We talked about racial biases and these little. Th things that we keep talking about the like eroding of of you know personality and, uh, and that really is the best way that I could explain it too I mean uh, uh, one of my stories was I mean I, I mean we could literally swap stories all day and all these little little things but you you know one of my friends I remember when I used to work at the movie theaters in Pullman Square for example when I was in high school awesome cool job I gave people popcorn all kinds of great stuff um and there was another black guy that worked there and he was from New York. And uh, he said, you're just gonna walk by yourself to your car? And I said, yeah. He's like, I'll come with you, man. Like, you good? And he was like, you can just take him to mine too. And I was like thinking like, you know why? And he, the more he, he would tell me his story where he was from in New York, um, it was all these little things about like, hey, don't like, you know, if you see someone walking down the street, like walk on the other side so that there's no issue. And so, there are so many little things like that. It's hard for me just to say like the black experience is for me. Um, so I don't, I, I don't know. I'm having a real hard time answering that, I guess, but cause I don't know that I know anymore. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've always, my parents and just how I've always looked at life is like, I can't imagine looking at someone else and saying, this person must be like this because they're this color or they have to act this. I've never understood that. I've never been able to wrap my head around why someone's automatically got me figured out because of the way that my skin scientifically and chemically that I made it has nothing to do with who I am as a person. Like I could be an incredibly kind person and be black and it wouldn't matter or vice versa. I could be a really kind 
white person or Chinese person, and some people are going to have biases. And I, I guess maybe that maybe that's what it is for me is there are people that are so obsessed with their own ideas and their own small bubble of thought that they literally are going to treat someone different because chemically the way that their skin was formed <laughs> is different. And maybe that maybe that answers the question, but I, I don't know that I know yet. I don't know that I really know exactly. Um, That's okay. That's good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mr. Mayo, same question. I, um, I had good friends that used to come from Dayton in the summertime, uh, a white family. As a matter of fact, the white family lived right next door to where I live now. But uh, anyway, uh, we could only go to Camden Park once a year. They would not allow black people to go to Camden Park except, the, I think it was like the last Sunday in August, and you had to come with the church. So the churches, and it was great for us. We loved it. We loved it. And as we got a little older, became a little older teenagers, we complained because we couldn't go to, to Camden Park. And our white friends would say, I'd say, I'd say, I'd say, well, how would you like it if you couldn't go to Camden Park but once a year? And, and their answer was, I'd go someplace else. And I was thinking, they just don't get, they don't get it. They just don't get it. I don't know if it's possible to explain to someone the black experience to a white person. I, I don't know if it's possible to do that. They, they don't get it. They, it's almost like when I was when I was younger and I was poor, and my kids were little, and they'd come to me and they'd say, "Dad, uh, uh, can I have uh, uh, two dollars to go to so and so?" And I'd say, "Well, I don't have any money." And they'd say, "Can't you write a check?" So they, they didn't understand. If you don't have any money, the checks are no good. They didn't understand that. So yeah, so I'm not sure if it's possible. Adios. I'm, I'm with I'm with Alan. I don't know if it's possible to explain Hola. to a white person Hasta the black pronto. experience. I don't I don't know Ciao. if it's possible. Okay. All right. Buenos días. Dr. McKenzie, do we? Hasta luego. Um. I think I'm I'm like uh, Mr. Brown and uh, Mr. Mayo. It's it's hard to put it into words. I keep thinking of something. My brother and I we have these deep, intense conversations um, while I'm in the car, <laughs> um, all the time. And so one of the things we we always talk about is that uh, growing up, we were taught that you had to be better, smarter, stronger, faster, um, more energetic, uh, have more stamina than white people to get a margin of what they had. And so um, I think about the fact that I just completed my doctorate and I did that because I wanted to get a different job one day. Um, and that's part of being better, stronger, faster, smarter, because I know, I know going in that my brown skin might prohibit me from getting a job that I might want one day. I know that going in. When I was a kid, it was my grandmother telling us, well, you have to be better. You have to be smarter. Um, you have to do better. You have to be nicer. You can't be mean. You can't be aggressive. Um, you have to watch your P's and Q's um, growing up. Now they call it imposter syndrome. Whenever I have this feeling that I'm not quite where someone else who isn't a person of color is. So I guess if I describe my Black experience, because not all Black experiences are the same. Um, my Black experience is a sense that I'm not quite as good as, I'm not quite as important as, um, that even if I work super hard and do all the right things, I'm never going to be as important. So that's my experience. Okay. All right. Thank so I can't you to the whole black experience, but that's mine. So I'm still work I'm I'm still a work in progress. Um I'm every day is another day to do more for me and to rediscover me after all these years. And I can't believe I'm trying to rediscover myself, but I am. This whole thing, like Dr. Normally talked about um George Floyd being her moment. Mine was Brianna Taylor. I there's a meme that keeps going around Facebook. Um if you don't do anything wrong then nothing will happen to you. 
she was asleep in her bed in her apartment. What was she doing wrong? So for me, that she was my moment when it's like, you know what? I just got to be me. And that's, again, that's my Black experience. Like Everybody's is different, but that one is mine. Yeah. And I think you're right. Every every experience is, is, is different. Uh, I do want to remind everyone, if you could, if you're not speaking, please, if you would um, mute yourself so that we don't have uh, interference. We did get, and, and Mr. Mayo, you, this came up, but I'll start with Mr. Brown on this question, but you mentioned this. It's hard to explain the experience. So we did ask those that pre-registered for this uh, this this conversation to, uh, if they had any questions, they could include it in their registration. And so one that we got, uh, that we received was, um, and it says, for someone who truly believes that they don't have any prejudice or bigotry in their heart or actions, what am I missing as a white person? Let me repeat that. For someone who truly believes that they don't have any prejudice or bigotry in their hearts, in their heart or actions, what am I missing as a white person? I think that's a profound question. So, Mr. Brown, can we start with you on that and, and go around? Sure. And I definitely, I mean, there are people that aren't prejudiced. I think what happens, whether it's through social media or media or just people in general, they, they get grouped into this first off they get grouped in this well i'm not racist or whatever like there's we gotta make it more personal and more it's not just like one or the other so there are ways that even if you aren't prejudiced i mean again like we've said the color of your skin simply because it isn't as dark as mine has potentially benefited you uh whether it's not that i'm not mad about that but that's just how it is um that I think I, I think everyone I've been asked that personally and it's saying I don't think any less of you like you don't think any less of me but because of our society there are things that help you out more than me and or detriment me more than you and um, Mr. Mayor was talking about like the checks I, I don't know that unless you you have knowledge of how money works or it's going to be exactly explained uh, i mean he he had a, that was a killer point there was people aren't able to see this because they haven't experienced it and like i i will never know what it's like um i don't know i mean to, I'm, I'm a man so i'm not a woman uh, i will never know what it's like to to have certain experiences because i've never been that and uh yeah i don't know I, I don't know what how to explain like what they're missing just know that these stories aren't made up when you say like you know someone got really uncomfortable when i got in an elevator with them because of something they'd heard or something they seen or maybe just their own thoughts caused that um there were people when again going back when i worked at the movie theaters um i was walking out and this is in the middle of the day and i was walking to go get and i had a little blue ford ranger at the time i was going to go go eat lunch and there was a woman who saw me walking in the parking lot I and mean, made eye contact with me. And you could see her body language changed, her, her, her urgency to get in her car and get safe away from me for whatever reason um, was different. And that's kind of where the, that, that's kind of what we're saying with this is you may not understand it because you've never scared someone just by your appearance. And that's that's how it maybe answer that is unless you've the sight of you has worried somebody you're probably not going to get it okay all right mr mayo same question for someone who truly believes that they don't have any prejudice or bigotry in their heart or actions what am i missing as a white person well i i have white friends that tell me stuff like that and what i tell them is i said oh no you're, you're probably racist, but you're not mean. So a person can be racist, but not be mean. You know, I think it would be really, really difficult for a white person not to be racist, not to feel that they're special. I mean, if, if you watch the TV, you look at the magazines, it's, it's beginning to change. Slowly but slow, uh, surely it's changing. But my entire life, I never saw a, a, a black cowboy. I never saw a, a, a black uh, a leading actor when I was coming up. So how could you not think that you're special? And, and, and white people are, are trapped in that history. 
they are trapped in that history that they're special. And so, yes, you're probably racist, but you're not a mean person, you see. So uh, I think a lot of people, anybody that feels that way, they're probably right. They probably think they're better. They're special, a little more special than you are. But they're, but they're not mean about it, you see. They Me wouldn't llamo Y soy colombiana. Soy empresaria. Tengo una empresa de informática. Well, that was Spanish. <laughs> Anybody understand Spanish? That wasn't someone cussing me out, was it? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't know what happened okay, to you. Dr. McKenzie? You. Same question. Um, I with Ms. Mayo. I don't know how you put that into the words for them. Um, they can do some internal reflection, uh, maybe. Um, Think about instances uh, like Mr. Brown said, I'm a woman, but I'm not a small black woman. I'm, I'm pretty tall. So I've been where he's been. I have been walking onto an elevator and had a white woman clutch her bag, her purse to her, um, not thinking anything. And she probably doesn't think that's a racist moment, but it is because you're telling me with that moment what you think of me and that you believe the stereotypes that black people are to be feared. I'm not sure where that came from because if I look, if you look right now, we aren't the ones out there carrying AK 15s or AR 15s or whatever they're called. We aren't the ones out there on the governor's lawn in Lexington, in Frankfurt, talking about hanging him. We aren't the ones. So I'm not sure where that came from. But I think it's a matter of they need to look inside, they need to look at their actions, maybe not with a mic microscope, but think about. Things that have happened, um, situations they've been in with people of color, and what their reactions have been. If, like, for, and I'm not gonna say they're racist, but I do have, think they have some biases, but I think we all have some. Because I say white people this, white people that, because when I grew up, I was taught certain things about white people. Now, I'm not surprising when you think about the fact that my husband is a white person, <laughs> but I didn't date a right white person until I was in the Air Force because I was told to stick with my own kind for both sides. Mm -hmm. um, both sides didn't see that as being racist, but if, if you think about it, that is, because you're telling me as a kid that I'm only supposed to be with other black people, black men, and I shouldn't look at white men and find them attractive. That's what you told me as a kid. So, and I know my grandmother didn't think she was being racist, but that was biased. So I think, maybe not say racist, but look at the bias that we might have in our lives. Because um, I think we all do. And I know every day I'm confronted with something and I learn something new. I hope I continue to learn something new, but I think it's looking at our actions and paying attention to how we respond and how we react. Like when we see something about immigrants, what's our first initial reaction? You know what I mean? If, if your reaction is they need to go back to their own country, where does that come from? That's a bias. Why do you think that? If you see a black person, you tell them, or you think, why don't they go? If they're so unhappy here, why don't they go back to their own country? What does that mean? This is their country. None of us came here by choice. If we're brown, except for Solomon, she moved here. <laughs> <laughs> but the rest of us, we came on, our ancestors came on boats and they were not cruise ships. So think about where are the ideas that you think come from. What makes you think that? Was it something that you learned growing up? And then where did that come from, from those people who taught that to you? Good, good, good. Salome, Dr. Ormelay. Okay. Yeah, um, and I think the confusion people have is they equate racism with not being good <laughs> or being a mean person, right? So when you say, oh, I'm not a racist in your head, you, you know, you, you're basically saying I'm not this radical person who wants to kill everyone, right? W yeah. Yeah, you can be racist and still be a good person, all right? And like, you know, Dr. McKinsey said, we are all biased. And I tell you guys all the time, I mean, for you to come and tell me you're not biased tells me you are biased because that's exactly what you've told me is that you're biased, right? So being able to acknowledge those areas where you're biased shows growth. Like you can actually, 
you know, <laughs> and the white people, you know, they say, you know, if you know where you fell, then you know, you know, you know where you can make your changes. So I can't even have the conversation with you if you tell me that you're not, you're not a racist, you're not biased. You have to acknowledge the fact that being a human being by its very nature means that you grew up with biases and prejudices like everybody else. Examine what those are and see how you can grow. But I, I think from the news media, from social media, people say, oh, oh, she thinks I'm bad, I'm a racist. No, you can be a good Christian, go to church every day, feed your neighbors, give one million and still be a racist, okay? It, it's some of those things that we do consciously and unconsciously. And, and since I'm a storyteller, I'll tell you one, right? Okay, um, I, I'm not terribly big, right? But I've been on campuses where people come to help me. It's my campus for some reason. They said, oh, the students, can we help you? And I go, no, I'm going to go teach my class. I'm not a student. Don't tell me that's not racist. Why? Because I'm black. And if I, any black person on a campus can possibly be, be the professor, right? You have to be the student who needs help. It's unconscious. It's racist. You know, why don't we, if you see a black person, why don't you first of all say, oh, she's the president of this institution. That's not the first thing that occurs to you. And she's a student. Right? So let's start there and basically, you know, walk away. If, if I'm not the president, I say, no, I'm not the president. I'm just a student. But start from there, first of all, and not start from the bottom. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Barnes, I see you have your hand raised. You want to make a comment? We can, you're muted, okay. I know, I muted, I unmuted. I Hopefully you can hear me now. <laughs> we can, uh, yes. We have three comments that I think are, are really um, reflective of some excellent uh, thinking and active listening. And I wanna start off with Mike's first, even though, and Mike, I apologize to you, um, I didn't interject in a timely manner. Um, it, it's, it's most relevant to what um, Mr. Mayo and Mr. Brown had shared earlier um, in the conversation and had been echoed uh, by Dr. McKenzie and Dr. Normale as well. And it's a quote that he shared from a psychology professor. So, you know, I wanted to jump on that since it's a psych <laughs> professor's quote. But um, the quote is, people only want to hear what they already think they know. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what makes it particularly challenging um, right now in the climate that we're in. It hurts to think that you may have unbiased prejudices against other people, but we have to be aware as humans that, that I mean, and Dr. Normally, you said that yourself, that as humans, these, these, are, these are things that all of us are vulnerable to. That doesn't mean that we can't change. Being willing to, to engage in, in self-reflection and becoming self-aware and taking the time to experience um, listening to your stories. Mr. Mayo, I had to turn my, my uh, camera off um, to think that you have served our country and that you were traveling to, to, you know, you enlisted, that you were traveling and scared, I'm sure, as a young man going off to fight for your country. And you were scared to go in and eat. You had to travel hungry. That broke my heart. So many of the things that have been shared today were heartbreaking, and that's something that, you know, Stephanie Burcham had commented, and um, I want to read what her comment was. It is so difficult to hear and see the hurt and pain each of you have experienced. Thank you for being so candid and giving. I wish you could see yourselves through the eyes of so many of your colleagues. You're amazing, well-liked, accomplished, and respected. You set the bar for many of us by your character and your accomplishment. I hope you can feel that love. And I hope that other people don't let their biases stand in the way of knowing each of you and how wonderful each one of you are and all of the wonderful contributions. Alan, I was just talking, or Mr. Brown, excuse me, I was talking about you uh, the other night at dinner telling my father that you had agreed to um, serve as a panelist and that we've called on you several other times to share your experiences openly and candidly with our campus community. And I, I want you to know how much I appreciate and respect you. And as a, 
faculty member as a professor, one of the things I value most is that I can learn from my students. And I want you to know how much you have taught me in addition to the other people that you've shared your stories. So thank you for that. And then, thank, thank you. <laughs> welcome. And then Barbara um, kind of wrapped all of this up, this idea that, and she says, I've recently learned that it's important to not just be accepting or tolerant, in quotes, but to be actively anti-racist. Mm. Um, we have to have to take action um, simply accepting that or believing that we are not doesn't create change we have to share what we feel our attitudes and our beliefs with others so that we can propel change forward those are the comments all right thank you thank you i know we're running low on time but there are two questions that i have to ask and we may go over just a little bit here but um first the first one is um what would you and Mr. Mayo, we'll start with you on this. What would you say to a young black person today? What would you what would advice would you be would you give to that person? And I do want to mention too that when I look at the crowds that are protesting right now, I see a diverse group of young people, uh, white, black, Latino, whatever it may be. And I, I see that and that gives me hope uh, for the future. But what would you say? Let's let's say it this way. What would you say to a young person today? who's concerned about what they're seeing, what would you say to that person today and, and as, a, as a way to encourage them? Uh, and I, I work with a, a lot of the young black men around here in Ironton. And uh, I tell you one thing I tell them, I tell them to uh, start some good trouble. Yeah. I heard that on TV and I said, you know, that's a good idea. Start some good trouble, you know. And uh, I, I, I always tell them, and. And this works because I get uh, I get calls. Sometimes the students come back here to visit me uh, from Columbus and Cleveland, places where they've left here and they've gone and gotten good jobs. And they say what, the things that I told them uh, helped them in their lives. I said, choose someone that uh, that is that is successful. Choose uh, some black man that is successful and follow their pattern. Following, you know, like the way I, I don't dress like this for me. I don't dress like this for me. I, I dress like this for my students. I, I, I dress like this because I want them to know I care enough about you to put on a, a shirt and tie to come up here to be with you. So, so I give them that advice that choose someone that's been successful and follow their pattern. Don't just watch TV and follow a rapper's pattern or or basketball pattern, basketball players pattern. Uh, follow someone that uh, uh, that is successful. Mimic what they did in their life, and uh, and hopefully that your life will be a success as well. Thank you, Dr. McKenzie. Um. I would tell them everything opposite of what I was told growing up. I would tell them to not be afraid. I would tell them to follow their passion. Don't look at where you could just find a job because I was told when I graduated high school, I should do something with numbers because I liked math. So I should be an accounting major. I hated it. That was not my passion. Um, I would tell them do them. Um, if you are natural hair, wear your natural hair. Do not be ashamed of who you are. And, and I wasn't told to be ashamed, but I was taught to be ashamed of my blackness growing up. So I would tell them exactly the opposite of what I was told. Don't be ashamed. Be brave. Be bold. Go out there and do you. Find your passion and do it to the best of your ability. All right. Dr. Norma Lay. <laughs> You know, first of all, I, I want to acknowledge the fact that being young at this time in our history is very challenging. Mm -hmm. And I, I, think, I think I want them to know that. The fact that I, I see them and I see the pain of trying to grow up in a mangled up world that we live in. But I also want them to know that in spite of it, in spite of the challenges, they can be the change they want to see. You cannot leave it to somebody else. Nobody else is going to do it but you. You have a voice. Use it respectfully, but use it. 
and don't let somebody else define you. Only you can set your limits and only you can define you if you want to be successful. When you let somebody else define you, well, it's over. Amen. So find your passion, follow it, and be you. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Brown. Yes, I'm going to echo a little bit, so forgive me, but That's um, it is awesome to hear. I'm on this, we're all preaching the same gospel right now on this question, especially, but um, do not be afraid to go against what everyone has said and kind of predestined you to be. Everyone wanted me to be sports or get into rap music or whatever, and, and I completely bum fuzzled them by going against the stereotypes. You know, I've I wore certain brands of clothing that they were like, what do you mean you wear that? Or I started playing in rock bands and stuff like that. And to to be able to defeat stereotypes is awesome. And don't be afraid to do that. Um, because of our color of our skin or anybody's skin, do what you love. Follow a passion. My little nephew is in high school this year, and he is just pursuing art and just, just everything about it. And, man, I love to see that because uh, you can tell when people – are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing with their lives. You know it. You can just feel it. And it's so beautiful to watch people do that every time that whoever has found whatever niche that they're they're going in. And that should never be and hopefully never is limited by what we look like, no matter what. And um, I cannot remember who said this quote, but they said, um, whether you think you can or you can't, you're correct. And it's literally up to us. And I tell my nephew this and I tell other people, man, you can't find what you love and just go after it. There's, there's nothing that can stop you except for you. Okay, thank you. One final question, but I, I do want to mention, I've been taking notes and I've heard social media mentioned multiple times, the impact of social media. So Dr. Barnes, I think at some point we're going to have to have another conversation just centered around the impact that social media has on these kind of issues. But my final question to you um, is this, what makes you most proud of your identity? What makes you most proud of your identity? And we'll start with Dr. McKenzie. My children, um, I think my husband and I, and I have done a really good job of raising our kids to discover who they are without us telling them who they are. I love what Mr. Brown said about uh, not embracing stereotypes. I'm paraphrasing, but I encourage my kids not to embrace those stereotypes. Too many times in our country, we see kids who live in inner cities who embrace the stereotypes associated with living in the inner city. Um, they know they aren't gonna go anywhere because somebody told them they weren't going to or society paints pictures of them that they aren't gonna go somewhere. So. And so they don't do anyway, anything. They get stuck and they get trapped because, again, this is the pictures that they paint. These are the images that you see in rap videos. And not to throw them against rap videos, don't get me wrong, but you see those images um, and you see them in movies and TV. And um, so I love that he talked about that. So I'm most proud of my children. My children are doing their own thing. Uh, my daughter went into communications, which is a field that I was suspect about because I was like, what's she going to do with that? <laughs> but she's doing amazing things with it. Uh, and my son is now a student at OU. But yeah, I'm most proud of my kids because I didn't raise them to have the self-doubts that I grew up with. All right, thank you. Dr. Norman. <laughs> You know, I'm just going to talk generally. I mean, I think, I think I mean, in spite of our challenges as black people, we are, we are a blessed people. We are a blessed people. And I'm happy to be black any day. I look at my ancestors, both those who came on the boat and those who did not. I am so proud of what they've accomplished. And I think that's what we need to teach our children, that we come from a rich pedigree of heroes and and the, the more we start to teach our children that and make sure the world understand in spite of the challenges we've overcome and we'll still keep overcoming and that's what makes me proud thank you mr brown i think i'm most proud about i, I don't know how to phrase it other than kind of the fruits of my labor um statistically or you know, and societally speaking, I guess, 
I'm not so supposed to be successful or I'm not supposed to be this or I'm not kind of going back to the stereotype thing, but people know me by how I treat other people. And that's that's the example. And that's kind of the legacy that I've taken pride with more than anything. It's not because I'm black that I would buy you food if you needed it or it's not because I'm a religious person. It's because of just who I am and somehow luck of the draw, whether it's how my parents raised me or all the people that I've had influence me in my life. Like I am most proud of that. And I'm, I'm most proud of, and I take pride in that actively. That's, that's another thing is I guess I'm able to take pride in everything that um, is kind of making me happy and making other people happy as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayo. I am, uh, I'm uh, proud of my identity because we are still here after hundreds of years of serious oppression. I'm proud of my brother Myron. He's 90 years old. He was the first uh, black uh, African American uh, from Ironton, Ohio to become a naval officer. I'm proud of my brother uh, Major Mayo. He's uh, 87 years old. He's still working as a dentist in a beautiful new office. I'm proud of my sister Barbara. She uh, ran her husband, Dr. Robert Dibble's uh, uh, medical practice uh, for uh, 50 years. I'm proud of my, my brother Henry, who uh, fought in Vietnam, was wounded in Vietnam, came back home, worked at the Defense Department and, and retired. I'm proud of Barack Obama, who became our first black president. It made me feel I cried all night when he became president. I'm proud of, of, of Representative Lewis. Representative Lewis, who said, start that good trouble. I'm proud of him and it made me proud of myself. And, and of Representative Cummings, I'm proud of him. And, I'm, and he made me prouder of myself uh, being an African-American. I'm proud to be an African-American. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'm proud of each of you. Uh, you've been great examples and ambassadors for this to start this conversation for the year. So thank you so much for being a part of it. Mr. Before Mayo. you say anything else, Robert, yes. I always, I always tell my students to look up to Robert Pleasant. <laughs> well, you, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I have so much respect for you and your family. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayo, Dr. McKenzie, Dr. Normalay, Mr. Brown, Dr. Barnes, any final thoughts? I just want to encourage everyone to think about the emotional experience that we all shared with each other today. Um, the kind of courage that it took to share the experiences that each of our panelists shared with us today. And do what we can to support our panelists by the way we live our lives, the example that we set for our students and for one another. We need to embrace each other. And I want to ask um, all of our panelists to please make sure to take a look at the chat feature here. Several folks who were participating today, uh, what I just said echoed so much of what they already shared in their thanks and many saying it was a privilege to be able to work with you and to be able to share this experience today. So please take a moment to, to take a look at, at that chat. And thank you all so much. And Robert, I, I echo what Mr. Mayo said. Um, I think so many people have the utmost respect for you. So thank you. I thank appreciate you. it. All right. I do want to announce before we go, our next conversation will be on October 21st, uh, same time with Josie Browning. Uh, she dedicated her life to, uh, to fight equality as a freedom writer. So October 21st um, uh, from 12 to 1. So again, thank you all for joining the conversation and have a great day.